I feel super humbled and honored and kind of shy being amongst all of y'all and all the power in this room and I feel like I can just see your ancestors surrounding you at your back, behind you, over you, affirming the amazing work you're doing on the land. You know, my family was part of the Great Migration, you know, exiled from South Carolina a couple generations ago, and there's a, a sad joy that comes, like, coming back this way and thinking about what we left behind. Um, and what we're now reuniting with. So it's really, really special to be here. You wanna say something? <laughs> All right. I should do my remarks, right? Or you yeah, wanna? I think, I, think, I think the way that we can, we can okay. just kind of flow. You know, it's all good. Okay. I mean, this is not as, now, you know, academic. Where? Yeah, tomorrow will be a little more academic. This is going to be a little more personal story. Yeah, I thought okay. it would be a good idea that instead of, you know, us getting into your whole presentation for tomorrow, I would do something a little bit more resonant for the moment, I guess. Because we got predominantly people of color in the room, right? And then tomorrow we might not. So how can we, you know, really cover some ground? <laughs> Word. So there's a story I want to share with y'all that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, so I'm black, I'm also native, I'm also European, a lot of heritages. And recently at Soul Fire, we've been doing a ton of organizing work with native community because we're in a giant land reparations project. And frankly, it would be pretty disingenuous and messed up to do land projects without the folks who originally own the land. And it has been humbling, fascinating to understand all the ways that we have harmed each other as black and native folks, all the ways we've been in solidarity, you know, everything from Buffalo soldiers to Cherokee slaveholders. Um, so I want to tell you the story that was gifted to me by Haudenosaunee elders. So Haudenosaunee are the original people, the Six Nations people of much of New York, which is where we are upstate. Um, in fact, the U.S. Constitution is partially based on their democracy. They have one of the oldest democracies. So this story is part of their creation story. It's about Sky Woman. And Sky Woman uh, is a deity, right? She's like the daughter of the universe. And she was like peeking down on humanity 10,000 years ago or so. It was the hungry moon, it's February, it's about now. You know, like all the food's running out. And all people have in their baskets is the seed that they're gonna plant for the next year. Uh, so it's not looking too good. But she doesn't just want to help them out without really seeing what their character is, right? So she goes down to the people in the longhouse and clothes herself as a beggar and puts out her hand and says, I'm hungry, you know, feed me. And the people, even knowing that their future was at stake, they're generous of heart. So they took all their seed from their baskets, you know, a little bit of dried this and that they had, and they cooked a stew and they gave her the one bowl that they had. So seeing their open-heartedness, right, she reveals herself as God, as Sky Woman, and says, because you are good-hearted people, I'm gonna give you my three children as gifts. And my three children are corn, beans, and squash. Because you plant them together, right, the corn grows tall, it's rich in calories, and minerals, starches, it provides the support for the bean, which fixes nitrogen, provides the protein. The squash has actually natural pesticides that protect the bean, and it, the seeds are full of oils and the minerals, you know, so, so you're good, like if you have corn, beans, and squash, and so the people weren't hungry anymore. And I've been thinking a lot about this story because corn is the most sacred crop for Turtle Island folks, including the Taino, including my ancestors from the Caribbean. And Native folks here even gave it to Africans before the Portuguese ever landed in Africa. So it's a sacred crop in Africa too. It's the mother of life, it's 10,000 years old, you know, it's used in ceremony. When I was initiated as a queen mother in Ghana, like we were only allowed to eat like maize and millet. Those were the sacred foods, right? So, but you look at, it was also gifted to white folks. And I was, just, I was thinking a lot about what the colonizers did to this food. Monoculture genetic modification, over-fertilization leading to the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, 
literally turning it into corn syrup that's being pumped into the veins of our children and fueling the diabetes and obesity crisis. Right? So it's like the bastardization of this sacred gift. It's the commodification of the Holy Mother Maze. And I've been just trying to reframe my whole situation at Soulfire, my whole work, as how do we actually decolonize and re-indigenize our relationship to the seed, to the soil, to one another. Because we've all been colonized to some extent, we've all bought into it, right? So what is that work to actually extract and reclaim? Like our ancestral grandmothers, they braided the millet, the sorghum, the cow pea, the black rice, the melon, the molokia, right, into their hair because they knew the seed was sacred and they fought in every generation to maintain the sanctity, but we're up against the empire. And so that's what I've been thinking about recently. What have you been thinking about? <laughs> You know, I've really been thinking about equity. Um, what does it mean for people of African ancestry to regenerate, uh, uh, regenerate spaces? Uh, what does it mean to be a person of African ancestry in Richmond, Virginia, and working to reclaim the land working to feed community in the face of uh, opposition, I think. Um, I like, I, I don't, I'm hesitant to use the word opposition, right? I, I, I think I'll use the word resistance, because I think people don't. Outside or inside? Both, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In your book, you talk a lot about historical trauma and um, internalized racism. So internally, uh, I, I think about that. Um, but I also think about um, resistance from uh, uh, white wealth, right? And what does that look like? I've been spending a lot of time thinking about white wealth, <laughs> right? And, you know, it is, you know it's, a, it's a really interesting conversation when you start to think about the work that we need to do in order to reclaim you know, our uh, space and who owns the spaces or quote unquote owns, like who has possession of the spaces and what does it take to get them to relinquish and redistribute that. So, um, I don't want to get too deep too early. <laughs> I think we got to ease into it. it. <laughs> um, but uh, what I was going to ask you to uh, kind of start with is just give us a rundown of what, uh, what is it that you, um, what is it that brought you to the work that you do now? And what inspired you to, uh, to write this love letter? to communities of color specifically, and to people, period, in relationship to liberation of the land. Wow, yeah, I wanna talk about white wealth, but yeah, we should probably start at the beginning <laughs> um, and then get to that. Let's see. I mean, I grew up totally in love with the earth because I was in a rural white town, and believe it or not, my light skin self really stood out in that town. So we, my sisters and brothers and I, we were harassed, like beaten, kicked. I mean, it was really rough. Um, people don't joke up there. And so we didn't have any friends except the trees. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time, and I'll tell you, my sister and I thought we invented, like y'all know about Arisha tradition or Ifa, like nature-based traditional African religion. We thought we invented that because we would just go in the woods and make these temples and stuff. Our ancestors were trying to help us out. Um, so when it came time to get a summer job, my, my mom and dad split, my mom was in Boston, and the food project, which is this urban farm youth thing was just coming into being, I got the job, I was totally hooked. Like here's a space where I'm around black and brown folks, I am finally belong, my weird earth loving self can be getting dirty and we're doing all this great community work because we were you know, in domestic violence shelters and farmers markets and stuff. Little did I realize farming was not like that outside the food project. So I was just like, oh, I'll get a job at another farm. <laughs> Looking around. So I, I didn't give up, though. And the reason I didn't give up, I worked at many rural farms. You know, I've been farming 22 years. And it was because at one farming conference, Northeast Organic Farmers, I went around with these little slips of paper. And anyone with melanin, I was like, meet under this tree at 1 o'clock. <laughs> like, we are... I was like 17 years old. I was like, we're gonna do this. And there was maybe 10 of it, it was like one table, you know. And um, Karen Washington, 
who is a farmer at Rise and Root Farm and is a national organizer for black farmers, was there. And she looked at me and she's like, don't give up. I can see that one day, you know, we are going to make a change and you're going to be part of that change. Five years later, we had the Black Farmers Conference and so on. But it really was that moment uh, when I was questioning, you know, is this, am I a race trader? Like, does this even make any sense to be doing the sustainable farming? And at the time, I didn't have any idea that the CSA was started by Booker T. Watley, as was Pick Your Own, that George Washington Carver was the one who gave us leguminous cover cropping strategies and compost. I had no idea that Cleopatra came up with Burma composting, or that the Ovambo people of Namibia gave us raised beds, or the Kenyans came up with terracing. I had no idea that our folks had innovated pretty much every sustainable agricultural technology that we take for granted as ahistorical. So the reason I wrote the book is because in 20 years of farming, that was my journey. You know, eventually we started Soul Fire, um, Soul Fire Farm. There's eight of us in the collective, sometimes nine, and we, you know, we grow food on five acres. We distribute it to those who need it most. We run training programs. We organize. There's a lot we do, right? But we had to develop curriculum to train farmers in a culturally relevant way. Um, it's all black, indigenous, Latinx, Asian folks who come through our farm, and we need to tell a correct narrative that centered people. So it was like really anthropological research. And it got to the point where our waiting list is two years long for our program. So I was like, we can't gatekeep that knowledge. We need a book so that everyone can know that we belong, you know? And so that, that's why I call it a love letter, because it's really like my 16-year-old self that needed to see that, to know that it was, that I belonged on the lands, um, that it was my rightful place, my heritage, to have agency on the land. So love letter for my 16-year-old self and all y'all, too. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, Soul Fire and the trainings, because I think when I first heard about your work, that was one of the things that struck me deepest, is that it's beyond just you know practical application. There's also this element of personal development, you know, these, uh, it seems to be a very, uh, what do you say, spiritual work in relationship to people coming to grips with some of these um, ideas and intersectionalities around race and identity and, um, you know, where they fit in those spaces. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about how, you know, what, what, is that, what does that look like and what is that about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was really honestly a surprise to me because the earth was never traumatizing for me. I kind of, I was lucky in that way because the people were traumatizing. Uh, so I'm trying to do these trainings and sit everyone down and teach them about cation exchange capacity, which is like the dopest soil indicator. I just love its stickiness. And then I was trying to, you know, teach them about the best herbs to put around your apple trees. And we did all that. Like, like we're spreadsheet people. But then in the evaluations, folks would come back like, I left a toxic marriage, you know, I was able to get off heroin, <laughs> like all of these things. And I was like, it's a farming program. Like, why are you talking about your alcohol problem, you know? And what I realized, of course, and what you probably all figured out a lot before me is that, you know, as Chris Bolden Newsome, who black farmer friend of mine, Philly area, he said the land was the scene of the crime. And so there's a way that we have all this trauma because of slavery and sharecropping and convict leasing and the lynching that happened because we had the audacity to try to own our land. We have all this inherited cellular trauma that makes like the, just the dirt can be triggering for folks or bending over can be triggering for folks. But the land was not the criminal. Right? The land actually has always been in African cosmology the source of wisdom and belonging and truth. Our ancestors are under the earth and the waters, Ambadlo, right? And the earth herself is an orisha. She has messages for us. I think one way that I've tangibly experienced this is, um, you know, Grandma Pine used to be short. All the trees used to be short because they didn't know how to drink rocks. They cannot do that. They can turn sun into sugar, which is amazing, but they don't know how to turn rocks into liquid minerals. Only fungus can do that. Right? So Grandma Pine reached out to Brother Fungus and was like, look, I got a deal for you. I'll give you some sugar. You give me some of that mineral juice, right? And then you can spread wide and I can grow tall. 
And so we have this amazing network in the forest, right? It started with the, that exchange and then it expanded to the internet, which is real fast under the forest where messages and hormones get sent. And you know, if Grandma Pine's about to die, she's gonna dump all her sugars into the network so her babies can live. I believe, and our ancestors believe, that when you touch your bare feet to that forest soil, when you put your hand on that tree, you actually get that information about what it is to live in community uh, what it is to have true cooperation, true mutual aid, and that's information that informs our human society, right? So when we're separated from the earth by layers of concrete, I feel like we walk around with this like aching little hole where we can't quite figure out what we're missing or what we forgot or what the meaning is, and it's when we get back connected to the land, like, yeah, we grow food, that's very important, but I think we also find that piece of our souls that we left back in the red clays of Georgia. So... Oh, yeah, I didn't answer your question. Though. Yeah, it's gonna... It's okay. Um, <laughs> I think I decided about the trees. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a powerful metaphor, and I mean, I think that, you know, as gardeners and as farmers, you know, like, we live in this world of uh, metaphor. Um, my brother, Ross Kofi, you know, he always says that um, the farm is life, right? Um, and it, it's, it, if anyone's been in the Ginner Urban Gardener program, you, you probably hear us, you know, talking about what are you composting, or just talking about trying to correlate these messages and gardening techniques to real life. But, um, you know, I wanna I want dig into this component of your work that deals with that human development that is tied into the working of the land. Um, what afforded you, like how did you, how did you come up with the model or what, what did, or how has it been evolving to do trainings around racial justice in a farm context, right? Because you, for those who may or may not experience racial justice, kind of this space is very unique. It's a very, how you say, uh, it could be a lot of talk, mm -hmm. right? But then at the same time, it's, it sometimes can be uh, exhausting to just continue talking, right? Mm -hmm. About what does justice mean? What is microaggressions? What is an ally? And all these type of things. But, you know, for me, I'm often wondering how do we move beyond just talking while recognizing that talking is a thing to do? And what I've seen in your work, it appears that you all have found a fusion between a dialogue and here let's do something together that you know can unpack so maybe you can help us like understand what your racial justice kind of orientation is and how did you get there and how did you end up doing trainings at so far in that world, in that world. yeah i mean there's sort of two kind of trainings we do so we have like black indigenous people of color spaces where we learn how to farm and we do the healing we need to do for ourselves those are caucus spaces and those came out of what the, that evolves based on what the community says we're lots of feedback loops we want to learn more of this less of this you know and, and we have our spiritual baths our drumming our dancing our storytelling all of that the white people work which it sounds like what you're talking about um we actually tried once to do like a white people week-long training on racism it was very powerful for them I'll give you one quick anecdote. This was actually amazing. So white folks often imagine that they don't have culture, right? Because the job of white supremacy is to erase ethnicity, including your Italian, your British, you know, wherever you're from, is to erase. And so there was this interesting moment when, for all of our programs, regardless of who's coming, we have a little spot in the application where we say, you know, what kind of cultural elements you want to share with the group? do song, dance, thing, because then we do a night and we share. Black and brown folks always fill it out. So I never thought anything. And then zero of the white, they just left it blank. Wow. It was fascinating. So it made me think when they came to the farm, because I'm not about like, I mean, it's fine if you, you all are, but I'm not so much about like shaming and all that stuff, but, but it was an important learning point. So I just said, okay, for the week, we are going to have a non-appropriation week. The tablecloths cannot be appropriated patterns. Mm. The food cannot have appropriated spices. The music cannot be from anyone else's culture. Everything we do has to come from y'all. Mm. 
and they were totally dumbfounded. Like, I was like, call your grandma and find out what she cooked because <laughs> we're not cooking, you know, we're not making burritos, like we're not doing that. So we're making borscht, like we're gonna do your grandma's recipes. And it was really amazing because at the end of the week, you know, there was a lot of deep learning and tears, you know, all the things, people did the culture share. But for our black staff, this was a very traumatizing week. <laughs> so we stopped doing that. So now we do <laughs> those type of trainings. <laughs> People were like, I never knew about Dred Scott decision. Oh my God, you know, um, that kind of thing. It's just really hard to be around, um, like folks having that raw learning, which they needed to do, but not necessarily in a, that space. So now all of our racial justice trainings for predominantly white organizations, we go to them. And it's been important for us to have very tangible action steps. So it's not about you changing your mind, it's about you changing your action, which is a Jewish concept, actually my husband's Jewish. And so in the Talmud, it says do and then understand. So regardless how you feel, reparations are due, policy changes are due, and we have a very detailed policy platform that black farmers put together, and clear next step. So you're gonna leave this training and you're gonna to commit to three and that's your work. You know, That's sort of our framework. So tell us a little bit about that, uh, that uh, policy platform. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's- I think you have to add to it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would love to uh, dig into that a little bit, but can you kind of give us an understanding of like, what are some of the, like, what are some of the ideas that are expounded and pulling inside of that policy platform? Yeah. I mean, some of them are real dry, like literal policies. Like we need the Air Property Act so that we're not losing our lands. You know, we need to fully fund SNAP and EQIP and the 2501, which is now something else. You know, so a lot of it is, is like that kind of stuff. There's also guidelines for if you're trying to partner with communities of color, how to make sure you're not rowing the boat and that you're really being supportive of their agenda, our stated agenda, so there's some of that in there. Um, the thing that's closest to my heart right now is the reparations map and the reparations work, which you alluded to earlier. Um, we've actually had 13 people get farms as outright donations through a reparations program. Most of them went through our program. <laughs> So who gave away the, the land and we're like, I've got land. So the idea with the reparations map, it's very decentralized. People put their projects on there. Uh, black and brown folks put their projects on there and what they're asking for and their contact information or it can come through us if they don't want to share that. And then inspired people with wealth, privilege, access give the things away. Um, and we do believe the government needs to enact whole scale reparations, but in the meantime, this person to person framework has, you know, allowed thirteen black farmers to have land. So we're very excited about that. That's um, so I have a bunch of more questions, but I don't want to absorb the entire uh, dialogue. So uh, Michael, if you could do me a favor. Um, what we can do is uh, this mic is like the talking stick. Um, the way that we would love to see is that folks, have, as you have questions, thoughts, uh, raise your hand and we'll pass you the walking stick and we'll go around and kind of banter back and forth in that regard. And I'm in y'all's home too, so I really want to hear from you about what you're doing and how, yeah, I'm in your home. I want to hear and learn from you too, so it doesn't have to be a question. It could be some sharing. Hello everyone. My name is Fernando. Okay. Give me some. Keep talking. All right. One, two, one, two. You guys, you guys. All right. All right. We have a. Uh, I'm from a family farm down in Southampton County. Family farm for about 100 years old. But we're experiencing a lot of black farmers in a situation that uh, they're losing their land because you know they can't even make enough to pay the taxes. So uh, we're looking at alternatives. And right now, some of the farmers, uh, we're trying to educate uh, to take a look at growing hemp. Uh, I know if you, some of you are aware of the new farm bill that just passed, where hemp will be legal to grow process. And I'm wondering if you are, if your organization or people you've been working with, have they been educated on this new, uh, agriculture industry and how valuable it will be in the near future. Uh, I think Michael is, is that. Yeah. And that's a real lot We've had several conversations about it. So. Yeah, you should. You should speak to that, Michael, because you, that's your, you know. You, that's you your of, thing. Because you, you we, we got offered a contract and we're deciding, so we've never grown it. 
Hey, um, <laughs> okay. Introduce yourself. Go ahead. I'm Michael Crowder with Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach Program. Um, hemp is now legal in Virginia. Um, no longer our industrial research but now available to be grown based on the farm bill. Uh, there's now two bills, three bills in the House of Delegates that's going through to fully legalize hemp so there's no difficulties with it. Uh, to me, personally, it's a great market to get into. Uh, just talking to the Commissioner of Agriculture as well as the, the Secretary of Agriculture yesterday, uh, to me that's our small form of reparations. Because it's an advantage to be able to grow it, uh, because hemp is not going to not have a market. How many of us have ever smoked hemp's other form? <laughs> <laughs> So it's mostly CBD. However, if you fertilize hemp, it moves into marijuana. So they are the same, but they're different. So it's, it's if you fertilize hemp, you will have more than 0.3 THC. All right. But just in my conversations with the governor and some other folks yesterday, there are also two bills in the state of Virginia that's looking to legalize hemp. I mean marijuana. So it's coming down the pike, even if we're not, if it's not legal now, it's coming. And I encourage all farmers, especially black farmers, to get in the game. Because you don't get in the game, you're going to get out of the game, and you're not going to be able to take advantage of this billion, if not trillion dollar opportunity. Uh, the advantages to hemp are significant, and marijuana is really significant. And this is a sidebar to marijuana. There are strains of marijuana that come from Africa that are much more unique. Uh, there's one that comes out of Congo that has what's called THCB. The THCB does not, it suppresses your appetite, it doesn't give you the munchies. <laughs> and it also is good for diabetes. So it suppresses your appetite and it's good for diabetes. So a lot of research that can be done on the, the, the plant, uh, you know, through Virginia State, Virginia Tech, uh, JMU and others. If we get in the game, it's a great opportunity for agriculture and especially organic agriculture. Hemp is also one of those plants that hates chemicals, metals. You have to grow it clean. You can't grow it with chemical fertilizers and things like that. Uh, or else it's going to really disrupt the chemical compounds of the plant. So uh, for black farmers, I would definitely say apply to get your license. A $50 license through uh, BDAX, Virginia Department of Agriculture. Uh, my farm is about to be licensed. Mr. Cliff Slade's farm is licensed. His brother Zebo's. To get a license, um, get in the game, and for $50 to get in the game, that ain't bad at all. But anyway, that's my. Uh, good evening. My, my name is Bernard Turner. A lot of people know me as Brother Zebo. I just wanted to bring to y'all's attention that here in Virginia, that we do have a minority, uh, Virginia minority hemp farmers group, Brother Fernando, Brother Prince. We're all part of that, so if you're interested, just get up with us, look up, look us up on Facebook, okay? But if you don't, you will be left out. <laughs> yes, I'm Cliff Slade with Slade Farms. I want to share a story with you about my application process. I was one of the first of 17 in Virginia to apply. I got my permit right away. But being the public relations person I try to be, I called my local sheriff and said, Sheriff Turner, I just got a license to grow hemp. The folk are going to say, yep, that's why he's been so successful, because he's been growing marijuana all the time. <laughs> and uh, I, I wanted him to know that, because I figured someone was going to tell him I was growing marijuana. And he said, I know. How do you know? He said it was covered in the Virginia Sheriff's Association meeting that these applications were coming up. The first person they call is the local sheriff. If you have a shady past, you may not get a permit. 
and they don't have to give you a reason. It'll stop right there. The other piece of advice he gave me was that uh, it would Hello, be my name is Patrick Johnson, and I'm a, a small farmer here in the uh, Richmond region. And my question is about the reparation project that you have. Um, are there any strings attached to uh, this land that these folks are giving out of the generosity of their hearts, or is there some types of loops that you got, uh, hoops that you got to jump through in order to uh, avail yourself of this uh, process? Amen. Yeah, our policy for reparations is give it away, no strings attached, no oversight. So for anyone to get involved with the reparations map as a donor, they have to adhere to that because uh, we're not looking for white folks to try to control our projects. So absolutely. I'll add one thing to that. Out of this reparations work, we wanted to formalize it a little bit. Um, and this doesn't impact y'all so much, but we have a land trust that we're forming together with 12 indigenous tribes in the Northeast and black farmers in the Northeast. It covers New England and upstate New York. Uh, we're in the incorporation process right now and that will allow people to donate lands because it will be a nonprofit organization. They could get their tax break and, and all the stuff, conservation easements, da, 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 in the land trust and the land trust can then redistribute those ground leases to the farming community, to the indigenous community uh, because there was a lot of interest, but some owners you know, can't, can't give it away like that without you know, some kind of tax break or da da da. So we, we created, we're creating an organization that's run by black indigenous people to formalize that. And I know that SAFON in the Southeast is trying to do something similar in the future. So hopefully we'll have, every region will have these types of land trusts going forward. Right, that's a very interesting uh, point that this allows me to segue into some, something that's happening here in the city. Um, the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust is an organization that in the last year, uh, was set up and designated as the city's land bank and it operates as a land trust. Mm -hmm. So under their guise, of course, like many urban land trusts, community land trusts, their goal is affordable housing, but they are very explicit in their second priority being urban agriculture and green spaces. So if a property falls into the land bank that isn't uh, fit for a home to be built upon, um, they have, we're working with them now to try to identify what that process looks like for transferal into community ownership. And I think it's a really revolutionary opportunity because these folks were like, yo, no, we don't want to hold a lease. We want the community to own the land. So how much does it cost? How much should it, like, well, you know, make it a dollar or $200. I mean, but then also take into consideration that there may be some folks that can't own land at that moment you know they might not be in a position where they feel comfortable with like paying the taxes and doing the infrastructure and all that different type of stuff so i allow that to be an option as well for Brownlee. so yeah thank you for second for giving me an opportunity to segue into that i want to ask you a question though in your book you talk about movement building mm -hmm. right um you talk about this three-tiered or this three-pronged approach to movement building and you did do that. Um, you talk about it as being three uh, spaces. One, uh, policy shifting. Two, uh, direct action, protest. And then three, alternative institution building. So I was hoping that maybe, you know, because in this room, I think we are a composite of all three of those spaces. We have folks that are advocates, right? And then we have folks that are uh, policy makers, right, or decision makers, or folks that are influencing policy, and then we have folks that are trying to develop alternative methods of engaging with the system. So I was hoping maybe you can uh, kind of like talk about what that, what that legacy or where those ideas came from in terms of like African American farmers and their relationship to like the civil rights movement, things like that. Like, how can we like take lessons? from you know those who were farmers during the 60s and 70s and allowed for many of our freedom riders and all those other things to evolve out of that. Maybe you can just chime on that a little bit. You mind? Yeah, sure. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that original idea, I like to think in threes because my elders in Ghana, uh, in Krobo land, they say latte ete no no da, which is like three stones make the cooking pot balance. Um, and I think sometimes in our movements, we get real caught up with criticizing each other. Too radical, not radical enough, not hardworking enough, you know. 
And really, we need all three prongs. You know, it's the folks who are chaining themselves to the pipelines and squatting up in those redwood trees that freak out the policymakers and make them come to the table with the reformists to actually change the law and get something, you know, done. And then you have the institution builders, like many of us in this room, that are painting a picture of what's possible in a changed world. So we know what we're striving toward, right? And creating these sanctuary spaces. So all of it, all of it deeply matters. Um, and as far as the civil rights movement, that elder of mine, I'm trying to have more older people in my life because they're so smart and amazing. Um, but Donald Halfkenny, who was a Black Panther, he actually fled the country. Uh, he lives in Germany now because he was being chased by the FBI and so on. So he was explaining to me that when he went down as a young 18-year-old to the South to register people to vote, you know, Freedom Summer and all of that, that the, the black farmers were literally the backbone of the movements. All the meetings they had, they would go inside of the house of the black farmers, pretend they're having Bible study, but there'd be like voter registration pamphlets in the Bibles, you know. Um, when the night Riders would come and try to get them, the black farmers would cut down trees and block the only road, you know, coming into the farm to give the activists time to escape. They leveraged their land as collateral for bail money. They couldn't get kicked off their own land because they were not tenant farmers, and so they could go ahead and register to vote, join the NAACP, and so on and so forth. We know the USDA punished them, but, but at the time. So the point being that these black landowning black farmers, probably many folks in your family, there would be no civil rights movement without y'all. And that's because of the alternative institution building. That was what those alternative institutions are what provided the foundation for people to go like march and protest and eventually in 65 you know to get some legislation change which was the you know civil rights legislation exactly um so tell us a little bit about that story um well uh you, you brought it up and i think this ties into kind of like maybe what could be our last couple points right um, you brought up the uh, point about uh the usda and their role uh and uh using their language, punishing, you know, um, African-American farmers. Um, we know we're living, what is it, two generations has uh, kind of like the uh, great migration, like we're two, yeah, maybe we're three now? Started in 19, it was a long migration. Yeah, yeah, so we got like, you know, three generations of uh, removed. I know my grandma, so I'll, I'll use myself as a reference, I got kids, so, Maybe that, then I'll be the third. So my grandmother, uh, well, my great grandmother came to the city, you know, um, in probably like the 50s, right? Um, and you know, uh, my grand, my grand, my grandmother, my mother, my mother didn't live in the country, so we still had a grandmother to go to a country, go to the country to visit. In my era, my kids not so much. You know what I mean? So that's why I say. Generation removed, but when we talk about the USDA's role in that Great Migration, and um, not only the, their role in it, but what are some of the other factors that kind of prompted this mass movement of people of African ancestry out of rural areas into the city? And um, you know, I'll see, we, we can kind of segue into that conversation about white wealth as a result after we get out of that. Let's one. Back to that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I remember when I first learned about the Great Migration, it was just painted all roses, like seeking opportunity in the North and the factory jobs and the Harlem Renaissance and jazz and all of this stuff. And not that there isn't part of the truth, but something that I've learned, you know, in these this research is that it was a refugee crisis, right? It was actually 4,500 people were lynched, the houses burned down, the crosses burned, the children kidnapped, right? And, and all of this was primarily targeting people who were considered too uppity. So they were trying to get off of the plantation. They were trying to own their own land or their own businesses, burning down rosewood and all. So all of this drove people away. So that was, that was kind of the first wave. But then the USDA, I mean, they've been discriminating all along from the AAA in, in 34 and, and moving up ahead. But what Pete Daniel writes in Dispossession is that during the Civil Rights Movement, 
the USDA programs were sharpened into a weapon to punish civil rights activity, which is why I mentioned that. So if you signed a petition, joined the NAACP, registered to vote, you would go bring your loan application into your local county, county agent and they would say, oh, I'm sorry, we're closed for the day, right? Mm -hmm. And this compounded over and over and over again uh, to ultimately leading to foreclosures and dispossession of lands. And it's why there was a class action suit. I'm sure you know Pickford versus Glickman. It was settled in 99 in favor of the black farmers. It was the largest civil rights settlement in the history of this country. Um, and something amazing that's going on right now is there's a couple million dollars left of that settlement, sadly because many of the people who had money owed to them passed away. Uh, it went on so long, right? Too little, too late. But there's a group of black farmers who've been meeting to try to create a fund from that money to support the next generation of black farmers. So we are, you know, carrying on that legacy of resistance through it. What do you think about white wealth? Well, you know, um, so when we talk about land ownership and dispossession, you know, one of the things that I love to like point out to people that are here in Virginia, Richmond, in, in particular, why the reason why I call this Ground Zero, um, you know, I went to uh, property uh, church. Uh, for those who are in, this, in, in Rome, Reveille uh, Church. It's in Carytown. So I went to Reveille for tours, the oldest, one of the oldest buildings in the city of Richmond. And it's also one of the wealthiest uh, uh, churches in the city of Richmond. So when they gave the story about Reveille, um, they said from this door, which is, uh, it's hard for you to reference because you're not from the city, but from this door, <laughs> you would used to be able to see the James River and that 50,000 acres was bequeathed to this original family from King George, right? And so, you know, I'm in this tour, it was with uh, Shane, this is with uh, our garden guides, right. uh, Sheriff Point. And it, I'm in the room and I'm like, wow, 50,000 acres from Malvern right. Avenue it's like two blocks from Broad Street, all the way to the James River, right, was given to these people. And I was like, damn. You can't even imagine, like, you know, you, it's hard to imagine how much land that is. But, you know, now, because it's all built over and things like that, you can even imagine to see James River from there. But that family inherited and passed down subsequent generations land and also wealth that was accumulated off of that land to you know their uh, progeny we think about our, our indigenous uh, communities here in uh, the region and as well as our African uh, communities uh, what was their inheritance no land of course right you didn't inherit uh, anything as a enslaved prisoner of you know, someone's plantation on. So, you know, when I talk about white wealth, it's often, it's really funny, it's a stark reality. Sometimes when you bring out white wealth in the room, people <laughs> like, yes, white people are wealthy. <laughs> it is not all white people, but the reality is, is that there are institutions. They're 16 times wealthier than black people. There Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. According to the Pew Research Center report last year. Right. So, so when, when we enter into this conversation around equity, especially through agriculture and, you know, land, you know, I think it's important to identify like the main possessors of land, you know, being wealthy white people, not just individual families, but also institutions and corporations that are run by such. You know, we, it's, it's, very, it's virtually, in my opinion, it's virtually impossible for us to talk about equity, for us to talk about sovereignty without identifying the fact that these are the, these are the obstacles that are at um, the door in that regard. So, you know, it's interesting to me just to see that cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. when we call a spade a spade and say, hey, you know, this is what happened not even a long time ago. I mean, you know, we can, I like to start with redlining a lot of times because it's easier for folks to digest 60 years ago versus let's go back 400. But um, yeah, that's kind of what I think about white wealth. And I think that there's a responsibility for white wealth to be accountable to 
you know, the errors, uh, you know, of the past. It's like, we spend a lot of time as activists, community organizers, cultural ambassadors, healers, undoing the trauma that we've inherited epigenetically, financially, socially, but there's never an onus upon white wealth to do any work. And that's, 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 that's what I've been really trying to wrestle with, like what does that Rubik's Cube look like? You know, on the opposite side of an equation, if we do all our internal work, there's still an entire segment of our population that's just been oblivious to their responsibility and role in this. So, I don't want to. I got it. Go. Okay. And I have a couple questions. So, first thing, uh, I'll ask this from a farmer perspective. Is your farm profitable? And if so, what made it profitable? I love that question because I mean something that's happened as soon as we start talking about racial justice is that people stop asking me about soil and I'm like I went to school for soil science like what let's talk about this so yes our farm is profitable it was very important to us we started as a family farm mixed vegetables CSA doorstep delivery when we started the nonprofit in 2016 we kept the farm book separate because we did not want to be training a next generation of farmers to be grant dependent. We wanted to show them a sustainable business model, which is hard because everything's stacked against you, so no shade of anyone who's not profitable like we. The, the reason it is, is because we do everything direct to consumer, no middle people. Um, so it's all 100% CSA. Doorstep delivery is actually cheaper than sitting at a farmer's market all day and maybe not selling. So we sell 100% of what we grow. That's part of it. The other thing is because we're committed to a low income uh, population getting the food, we use a sliding scale model based on income and wealth and we have about half the people below market and half the people above market in terms of what they're paying so it balances out we're not making a lot of money i would say that the pasture raised poultry has the highest margin probably followed by some of the, the greens and stuff and some of the things don't make any money but it works out in the end uh, we gross seventy thousand our expenses not including labor like 35 36 thousand for the five for the five acres. So in that process, did you have to educate or relearn your customer base to appreciate the food they were eating? Many times we talk about food deserts, and the reality is it's not much of a desert, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. Food is there, but they, what they choose to buy, you can, Newports and Black and Miles are there, <coughs> not too far from there, it's collard greens right. and Cheetos, but you know, they choose, most, some people generally choose to buy not healthy. Yeah, I mean, where we are, it's a legit food desert. I mean, there's like no, not even those little like produce areas in the bodega, like nothing. Um, so yes and no. I mean, for one thing, I really do believe it's access over choice because I've experienced that when the people have the food, they'll eat the food. But we try to grow as many culturally relevant vegetables as possible. We still sneak in some weird stuff like purple kohlrabi. That's a weird thing. But our marketing strategy for the purple kohlrabi was all based on the Black Panther movie. So we grew a lot of purple vegetables. We marketed them as vibranium, as like superfood. People would like, give me more purple kohlrabi because it's anti-cancer and da, 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 da. So we try to like connect, you know? <laughs> it does look like vibranium, the little purple balls. We sold all of it. Everybody wanted it. I know it's a lot of farmers in here who are talking. Anybody got another? I know there's a lot of farmers in here who are looking for greater markets. And many times we have a tough time getting black people to support black farmers. We generally put a lot of blame on USDA and others. It's like, okay, well, if you supported me, I wouldn't need to go to them. So what was your strategy to make sure people support you? I mean, I know you said about brain and all that, but I mean, that... No, but that was later. I, I mean, originally it was relationships. Because we started the farm, we were living on the block in the south end of Albany. And we didn't have any good food either. And so our neighbors got together and convinced us to start the farm. And every winter, most of my time, I'm spending giving free nutrition classes in the school, at the community center, talking in churches. So it's very much, it's a marketing and community service strategy. So I was at Kwanzaa, you know, a couple weeks ago, like just talking to everyone, handing out samples, da da da, and then people sign up. So a lot of it is just being in the community and keeping those relationships. 
Hey, um, my name is Omari. Uh, I'm the director of an organization. I'm just going to give you a little background because you say you know you're visiting. So, um, uh, I'm the director and founder of an organization called the Richmond Food Justice Alliance, and a lot of our members are in the room right now. And um, you know, we we push for healthier food access into our communities right here in Richmond by expanding you know what access truly looks like and keep being uh, aware of the historical inequities in Richmond specifically that have uh, driven uh, low access to healthy food and you know keeping in mind you know the, the choice you know and why what is guiding people's choices and, and things like that um, and we're also a part of a, a larger project called the Food Justice Corridor which is uh, aiming to strengthen the local food system, um, particularly community-based and um, with uh, communities of color. So I I'm a member of the, the working group for the land bank that Devon was talking about, the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. So it was really interesting to me what you were saying about you know the reparations project and you know the fact that you guys are forming your own nonprofit. And, um, you know, the Alliance does a lot of community engagement work in the city and, you know, we believe that, you know, the messages have to be unique to the audience that you're trying to direct. Like, I think that's really great that you guys did the thing with the Vibranium, you know. Um, I think that's really awesome. We have a project right now where we're engaging the community in a, a culturally relevant way like that around uh, food policy recommendations that the city is going to adopt that are, are coming out of the, the uh, impacted community. So um, that's really interesting to me. But um, my question is, you know, as Duran sits on the, um, the board for the land trust, and I'm a member of the, the working group for the land bank, which is a component of the land trust. So we have been pushing uh, the organization to uh, flesh out what uh, equitable land acquisition looks like. Um, uh, their land bank is in its first, you know, it hasn't even been here a year yet, so we still have some work to do. But, um, so, the land trust that you guys have created, uh, what areas, like geographically, I think you said something about um, Northeast United States, but what areas are you going to, do you expect to be acquiring land from, and how does that tie into the reparations project, or does it? And you know, because I'm kind of thinking, how do we apply that to urban, uh, urban park land parcels uh, in, in Richmond? And have you guys been dealing with urban land parcels, or is it just urban? <coughs> and, you know, just what does that look like? Thank you so much for sharing all that. <laughs> I want to learn more about all well, the things okay. you're doing. We can talk. About it. We can definitely talk more. Yeah, the land trust. Um, is New England and upstate New York rural and urban properties. And that debate is really hot around leasing versus owning. Right. So the framework of this land trust is no one can own the earth, right? But the land trust is 100% controlled by black and indigenous people. So it's not like some white folks are controlling it and leasing it to black folks, you know? So it's a little different maybe. Um, and then the reparations map is a project of the land trust but it, anyone in the country can participate in the reparations map. Or make your own or whatever. It's just a simple, it's like a matchmaking service. I think I heard about it. I yeah. That's exciting though. I want to be in touch about your land trust because we're trying to support each other all around the country to do this work. All right, so we're at 8.15, right? And we're supposed to be done by 8.30. Um, I like cutting it close. <laughs> so uh, what, I, what I want to do tonight before we close, I'm going to actually have any closing remarks before I keep going. You know, we got plenty of food here and there's to-go plates, okay? So if there's extra food, you know, I don't want to have to try to figure out why I'm taking this food, right? So if you got hungry bellies in your home or other individuals that would like to have something to eat, make sure you avail yourself of what's available. Second. Uh, I'm, we're probably going to stick around for a few more minutes and get a couple, you know, uh, libations going at the bar just to kind of, you know, continue the conversation after we're done. And if folks would like to, you know, purchase uh, the uh, Farm and Wild Act 
Black Book. Ira has brought a couple copies here for such purposes. Is that correct? I got them fine. You got to go. Well, no, I, I, you know, I bought them and I you can usually sell them, you know, just at the regular price. But I thought, we could try this sliding view scale. Because I want everybody who wants one to be able to home with one. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, so you, you see that? It. How does that work? So those three things, make sure you get some extra food because there is extra in there to go place. Two, um, book is for sale. And three, you know, we're going to make sure that the bartender leaves with a little uh, scribble in his or her pocket <laughs> as well. Um, in the back, Allison? I, yeah. Hi. My name is Allison. I am, I'm the chief urban farm mobilizer at Churchill Activities and Tutoring. And so I work with a lot of teen urban youth and trying to cultivate these these conversations, these dialogue about why farming and being connected to the earth is really important. And for whatever reason, each of them comes with their own different lens and their own different perspectives about work and about family and about life and about food and about eating and what's important. And I'm just wondering, what are some practices or maybe a story or some things that you've seen valuable in your journey? Because I've seen in the book, I haven't gotten to chapter, I don't know, is it 16 with the youth? I'm on chapter 11 still. I've been sitting up for a week and a half. But I'm eventually going to get there. What are some things that you've seen are really valuable and helpful in cultivating these dialogues with you? Oh, man, the youth are tough. They come up to the farm in those vans and then they don't want to get out, you know. It's all the chips everywhere and they got the earbuds in and the hoods up and they're just like, nah, miss, nah. Yeah. They're scared of everything. But you know what they're more scared of than bugs? They're scared of getting left alone in the woods. So when when all the other youth leave and go to do something and then like one is left behind, they're gonna come along anyway. And what we found is actually not dialogue, it's experience. So we can't tell them anything, we can't convince them anything, but they get to hold, and this sounds so trite and played out, but honestly, they get to hold a chicken, they get to harvest lettuce, they grow the food, they pick flowers and bring it home to their mom, and their mom is happy. They play with my son and make bows and arrows in the woods and target practice. And I swear to God, we have had thousands of young people come out to the farm and like the universal response is something akin to, can I have my birthday party here? Like, <laughs> not six flag, like can I have my birthday party? And I really think, and maybe this is just my closing, I really believe that the earth has been calling us home and just like longing for us and that y'all are doing God's work uh, in tending the land and reintroducing young people to the land. But actually, all we gotta do is make the introduction because the earth is like ready and waiting and in partnership with us to take it the rest of the way. Albert. Mr. Walker. I just want to say, man, thank you so much for... Oh, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, the invitation to dinner and the discussion and the dialogue. Um, you described something... I'm sorry, can you hear that one more time? Yeah, you. Yeah. I know you're wrong. But... <laughs> My name is Thea. You described something, uh, and you articulated, articulated it so poetically, that like, uh, I think you're right. There is a calling for some of us who are like, it, it does speak to us. And uh, and I appreciate you you, you bringing that to us. And, um, and then being around all of black farmers and just not even knowing I know it, it exists. I mean, I look at Queen Sugar. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Y'all laughing, but I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> 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 and and um, like, I'm looking at YouTube, and I'm looking at your homestanding videos. And for some whatever reason, my algorithm don't show me black farmers. <laughs> and, uh, and it's all like, and then so I'm here, then I'm like, what is going on? And um, I'm just really happy. And, um, and, I'm, and I feel like I'm OK. Um, but I'm encouraged. And uh, thank you for your work. I'm going to get a book. And I'm looking forward to finding connections. And like, where would I find a black farmer who's doing grass-fed cows? 
I mean, can I do that? Okay, so so then this is great. <laughs> Yeah, you're doing all this happily National Day stuff, and that's cool, and that's great, but why are you not talking about where food comes from? And I'm forever indebted to that because the transition of my career, when I finally realized that, yes, I need to be getting my hands dirty, it's been like lightning struck and a whole nother universe open. It's like Rick and Morty in the portal gun. Like, I stepped into a whole nother you know, paradigm, like, whoa, this is what this looks like over here? Like, what was I doing on the other side? Like, so thank you for all of your work um, here in that regard. So we will be continuing these experiences, the Food for Thought experiences, uh, in collaboration with Initiatives of Change. You all should stay tuned if you are not on our email list. Make sure you get on it because this is the second time we did this. And what's funny about this is that there's a huge level of like, I don't know, what is the word, kismet, and like that? So stuff is just like happening. happening. Yeah, so I'll tell you the story. When um, we brought Malik Yakini into town, he just happened to be at another event in Charlottesville. And we called him and said, hey, we got this idea about you doing a breakfast, can you come? Sure, why not? And then we had reached out to Leah when she found, we found out she was coming to uh, Virginia Association of Biological Farming. And at first it's like, I don't know if we can make it work. But then she hit me back. I was like, yeah, hey, let's figure out a way we can do a dinner. So, you know, I like to say that spirit moves through this work. And when you step out and take one step, then, you know, you ever see um, uh, the Indiana Jones last, uh, what was the movie? The last, the, what was the last one? Raiders of the Last One. Raiders of the Last One. Yeah, but there's a scene in one of the Indiana Jones movies when he's trying to get the uh, chalice from the other side of the chasm, and like he don't know. Yeah, and it's like open. He had to throw the sand, and then he took the steps, and it's like that's kind of what this work is like. You don't really know if there's a floor. But you gotta step out there and find your footing. So you know when you do that, you know the creator will meet you on the other side. So with that being said, um, if there are any other remarks, please uh, let's save them for more intimate dialogue. Come get a book. You'll be set, uh, we'll be signing books. Thank you all for coming tonight and give yourselves a round of applause for being with us. I'm so very thank you, thankful, and uh, shout out to all of the Lewis Ginner staff that came. Raise your hand if you're here. Tanisha, Randy, Jonah, and our executive director, Shane Tippett. You know, without him, I wouldn't be doing a lot of this work. So yeah, doing... Yes, indeed. It, brother Chris Brooks is here, right? Who's the one? I wonder where they are. So uh, before we leave, if y'all can go check out and get a drink and thank the chef yourself personally for the food, I'll be so enthusiastically thankful and appreciative of you giving that energy out. Y'all have a great night. Love y'all.